My name is Victoria, and I am a partner here at Mercy View. Today, I'll be reading from Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. These verses can be found on page 461 in the ESV Bibles underneath your seats. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to take one. They are our gift to you. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, in the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hey, my name is Trey. I am uh, on staff here at Mercy View as the executive director. Great to have you with us. Kids, great for you to be in service with us today. Uh, before we jump in, I just want to say a, a big thanks to all the guys that came out to Men's Retreat this uh, past weekend. Man, it was a great 24 hours. We had a good time. And, and dudes, I want to tell you thank you for actually doing what I said yesterday and singing this morning because I could hear you singing. Um, it was really cool uh, to hear as we were all gathered together uh, the four sessions we had and just the the guys' voices singing like Brad and I were talking on the way back last night. We, we don't know that we've ever really heard, uh, even at the men's retreats we've had in the past, like just the, the kind of like participation in that corporate singing we had. And I'm glad that you brought it back with you on Sunday. And also, man, I'm really, it's really cool to hear all the kids' voices in here singing. Like here, I, my kids are singing, my baby's like singing a little bit, like no words, but like, it's a lot of fun. I love it. Um, it's awesome. Uh, thank you for being here on Family Worship Sunday. This is a really important thing that we do. Sean's like already talked about it this morning, but it's really important for us to recognize that when the people of God come together, the people of God are made up of moms and dads and sons and daughters. Like our hope and our goal is for each of these little kids that are in here to one day put their faith and trust in Jesus. Like our goal is for them to hear the word of God preached and proclaimed over top of them and to come to the table at the end of the service and take the bread and take the cup because they know and they trust Jesus because they found him to be good and satisfying. And what we're talking about today is really important, kids, for you guys. And so before we get into our discussion on this, this text that maybe doesn't seem like it would be that important, maybe you didn't really understand a lot of the words that were read, there were some funny names in there, I want to ask every kid in the room to stand up on your feet. You're not going anywhere, don't run off. There's no class for you today. I want you to stand up though. If you're a kid, stand up, stand up. Now, I know that you got to be really still when you're in here. And so I want to give you a chance to not be still for just a minute, Okay. I'm going to count to three, and when I get to three, I want you to just give a little shake, wiggle a little bit, jump up and down, don't run off, stay wherever you're at, next to your parents, within arm's reach, okay? But I'm going to count to three, and we're going to do one, one time, and it's going to be a practice run, and then we're going to do another one, okay? And so when I get to three, don't move until I get to three, but stand really still, and then when I get to three, I want you to just shake and move, and you can even like whoop and holler a little bit if you want to, okay? Are you ready? You guys want to do that? Yeah? Okay. All right. All right, on the count of three, one, two, two and a half, three. Oh, yeah. Y'all are really quiet. Can y'all be louder than that? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Good job, good job. That was a good practice run. I think you can move a little bit more and be a little bit louder. So let's, let's try that, okay? I'm going to count to three one more time, okay? Don't move until I get to three, okay? Man, Jansen's standing still. I'm really surprised. Um, one. Two, three. There we go. Got some wiggles. Yeah, get them out. Get them out. Let's go. Give me a big, give me a big, yeah. Awesome. All right. Now, you guys can have a seat. Sit down. There we go. Okay. All right. Good job, guys. Hey, so listen, for for the next, like, 
20 minutes. I'm going to try to keep it right down there at 20 minutes. I want everyone here, kids included, I want you to listen to what we're going to talk about today. Because as we talk about God's word today, we're talking about something that is really important. Even though every time we have a Sunday like this, when we're all together, God's word is for you. Today, kids, it's got even more application to your life right now as you get ready to go back home today. Because what we're talking about today is something that is for everybody. Moms, dads, and kids need to know about this. Because what we're talking about today is obedience. What we just did a few moments ago when you guys stood up and you followed those directions and you stood still until I got to three, right? And then when I got to three, you danced and shook and then you screamed a little bit. You were obeying a command, right? You were listening and you were following directions. Waiting until I said to start moving, to start shaking. And that's kind of like what is happening in the book of Haggai when the prophet comes to the people of God and he tells them what God has to say to them. Like you guys this morning were following instructions and doing what I said to do when I said to do it on the count of three. God's people in Jerusalem heard God's voice through the prophet Haggai and they chose to follow God's instructions or not. And I'm sure you know what it's like to do that in all sorts of ways in your life. I got home yesterday and like for the first time in like a month, my kid's room was clean. And Ellen said it wasn't because she cleaned it. It was because she gave them instructions and they picked up their room. They had a choice to obey or not to obey yesterday. You get opportunities to do that every single day. It could be cleaning your room. Maybe it's taking your dishes to the sink after dinner's over. Maybe it's not pulling your sister's hair whenever you really want to do it. But something you maybe didn't realize is that not just the kids in the room have to obey and have to listen. Everyone in the room today has to be obedient in life in some way or another. Being a grown-up doesn't mean getting to do whatever you want whenever you want. And for those of you grown-ups who haven't figured that out yet, I'm sorry. Even if it may seem like it sometimes, being an adult means still that we are bound by rules. We are bound by things that we have to do. There's a speed limit. If I go over it and I pass an OHP trooper, I will get a ticket. There are rules and regulations around the things that we do at our job. And if we break those, we might not have that job anymore. There's tax laws. And when I make money, Uncle Sam gets a piece of it. And if he doesn't, he will come and take it. On and on the list can go. And what happens when we aren't obedient when we should be is we got to deal with the consequences. And so maybe for you kids in here, when you don't do what your parents say, you end up in timeout or you get grounded or that toy that you really love is no longer yours for a little bit. And for your parents, it can be even worse. It can be a speeding ticket. That's a few hundred bucks that you don't want to spend. You could lose your job. And as important as all the examples of obedience I just gave are, there is an even more important person and an even more important type of obedience that all of us are called to and have to obey and have to do no matter who we are or how old we are. We have to obey God. You see, God cares about our obedience because God cares about us. Just like moms and dads care about their children and they make them do things they don't necessarily want to do, they ask them to obey in times that you really don't want to, God loves his children enough to say, here are the bounds of your existence, here are the things that I desire of you, and this is what you need to do in order for your life to be flourishing. God has rules for us because he cares for us, and he cares about our obedience because he loves us. When God says he wants us to do something or he doesn't want us to do something, it's not because he's trying to suck the fun out of life or because he wants what's worst for us. 
There's a pastor named John Piper who says it like this. God isn't a killjoy. His rules and the things that he calls us to are not meant to snuff out the joy in our life. In fact, the reason that God lays requirements on us is because he wants us to have joy. He's not a killjoy. He's opposed to the things in life that will kill our joy. And we find joy most by being satisfied in him. There is a way to live life well that pleases God and leads to a happy and fruitful life. And there is a way that leads to the exact opposite. And what we saw last week as we unpacked Haggai chapter 1 verses 1 through 11 is that Israel had learned this firsthand. They had come back from exile in Babylon. They're coming back to rebuild the temple. And for a decade, that temple is sitting empty It's unbuilt after the foundations are laid because God's people were disobedient. Because God's people got their eyes off of the things of God, off of what God had called them to, and they got their mind and their eyes fixated on building a life for themselves. And in their disobedience, God lovingly corrected them. Like Brad unpacked this, God sent drought and he sent famine And he frustrated their plans. And it was a kindness to them. Because in doing so, he was drawing them to himself. And so then he sends Haggai to tell them, hey, this is the reason life has been going the way that it is. And now, God is sending me to tell you that you need to return to him and begin building his house once again. You have an opportunity now. While things are uncomfortable, but kind of mild in terms of the consequences you're facing, you have an opportunity now to turn to me in obedience. And today in the story, in the text that we read, we see the people of God's response to Haggai's message. We see that as opposition is mounted to their work in the temple, and they've stopped doing this work for more than a decade... God is saying the time has now come when you can stop building those paneled houses, these luxurious lives that you're building for yourself, and you can start focusing in on worshiping me the way that I've called you to worship. And as Brad pointed out last week, God was calling them back to a way of obedience in regards to how they use their resources. And so, at the end of verse 11, we get left wondering how they're going to respond. And then we pick it up in verse 12, where we are this morning, and we see their response. And so what I want to do for the next few moments is I want us to see uh, how the people of God respond to God's word, how their response to God's word leads to renewed and right worship, and how this response and this right worship begins to continue and carry on through the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And we see God do some really amazing things throughout the course of the next couple decades in the life of his people. And so the first thing I want us to see this morning is in verse 12. And that's exactly how did God's people respond to God's word through the prophet Haggai. After hearing God's word, they acted in obedience. That is not the way that most Old Testament stories go. Most of the time, God's people hear God's word and God's people go, so? They don't respond in obedience. But this time, for whatever reason, because God loved his people, he sent a prophet and the prophet comes and preaches and the people hear it and they go, oh, oh man. And they turn in obedience. Look at verse 12. It says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. Their response to hearing God's word was to repent and obey. Now, the word repent isn't in there, but it is implied. To repent means to turn 180 degrees, to do an about face, to be going this direction and now start going this direction. They had neglected God's house, and so God confronted the people with their sin. They were consumed with their own wants and their own needs, and God says, I want you to be consumed with the things that 
are about me. He says you're more afraid of, di- of angering the peoples around you than you are of disobeying God. And God called them to obedience. And we see that in fact they do obey. They do a 180 from top to bottom, right? Zerubbabel is their governor. He's their leader. Joshua is the priest. He is their spiritual leader. But it's not just the leaders that turn in obedience. The entire people, the entire remnant that has come back from captivity in Babylon, from this exile, they come back in and they're confronted with their sin. And unlike their fathers, they hear God's word and their hearts are softened and they respond with obedience to the word of God. And so maybe last week as Brad unpacked verses 1 through 11, you were pricked in your heart, right? As, as Brad talks about just the way in which we can so often fill our lives with this fixation on our own wants and our own needs, and we can build our lives for ourselves, looking at our resources as though they belong to us and not to God. Maybe you were convicted. I know Ellen and I were. We had a couple conversations this week about some things just related to that, about the fact that there's a way to obey God that we're not doing in a certain way and we need to do it differently. Your priorities are out of order or maybe they're blatantly sinful. And if you heard that last week and and you had that feeling that you got two choices, right? That you've heard God's word and now you can either obey or you can disobey. What you can't do is claim ignorance. And maybe last week didn't cut you to the heart because maybe by God's grace, you're someone who's been able to really keep your financial and your resource is in check. Like your resources, material or otherwise, they don't really rise to a place of idolatry for you. And so the direct application from the text last week, maybe it wasn't necessarily on you. But I can imagine over the last six months, maybe, maybe even just the last month, like there's been something from the word of God that's been preached that stirred your heart and you felt that ting of conviction and in that moment you had one of two choices you can either obey god and recognize that conviction is from the holy spirit to lead us to life or you can just ignore it you can choose to disobey you've heard god's word now you get to make a choice and so You see, God has spoken through his word and he continues to speak through his word as preachers faithfully expound the scriptures because he desires your heart. And the clearest evidence that he has your heart is through your obedience or lack thereof. God desires obedience and obedience comes from hearing the word of God. Mere belief intellectual assent to the gospel and the things of God, the nature of God, the goodness of God, the work of Christ. It isn't what God wants from you. God wants your heart. And the evidence that he has it is that he has your hands and he has your life. James says, you believe? Like you you have like this idea of who God is, like you assent to knowing that God is God. Even the demons believe and they shudder. So what separates a Christian from a demon? It's not belief. It's obedience. The demons know who God is and have no choice to, be- and, uh, and have no choice to believe that God is, uh, isn't who he's always been. What separates demons from Christians is that demons, though they know who God is, they choose willfully to disobey God and rebel against him. They reject him as God. And so what is it showing in our hearts when we hear the word of God? Know that we're not living it out and we walk away unchanged. God's word spoken to God's people leads to obedience. And if we've been bought by Jesus, we are God's people. And his word has been spoken to us and we have an opportunity to obey him. And so here's the second thing I want us to see this morning Obeying God as his people leads to right worship. Look at verse 12. It says at the end of verse 12, and the people feared the Lord. See, at the time that Haggai spoke, the temple had been sitting with foundations laid untouched for more than a decade. 
For the old covenant people of God, the temple was not just a building, but it was the place where they were actually able to worship God the way that God had prescribed. You couldn't just come up to the king of the universe whenever you please. God had ordained specific things to be done in order for worship to take place. The pinnacle of that worship being the yearly sacrifice of atonement for sin that had to be done at the temple, that had to be made at the altar the way that God prescribed. It's courts, the Holy of Holies, the veil. None of that existed when the temple laid in ruins. And so the people of God could worship, but they couldn't worship rightly. And that's just the physical barrier to the right worship. You also have the reality that 10 plus years of neglecting to obey God had undoubtedly caused their hearts to begin to harden. Maybe the first six months, every time they would walk by the temple mound, they would look down in shame because they knew that they should be doing something, but they weren't. But now that's a distant memory. It's a distant memory of a dream they expected to never seem come to fruition. But God's word, it jars them from their apathy and it drives them to obedience. And as they obey, they begin making preparations to rebuild God's temple. And before a stone is stacked or a lamb is offered, their hearts are turned toward God as they fear the Lord. Now, one thing that we need to recognize is that obedience, the kind of obedience that we're talking about today, the kind of obedience they have that leads to worship for these folks is obedience that is happening inside of a covenant relationship with God. This is obedience that flows from their status as being part of God's children, as being part of God's family. It's not obedience as a way to be made a part of God's family. Obedience has never been and never will be the doorway into fellowship with God or a seat at his table as a part of his family. It has always been grace. As Sean said at Men's Retreat yesterday, from top to bottom, grace has always been the way that God has worked in the old covenant and the new. It was grace when God called them out of slavery in Egypt. And it's grace all the way down to him calling you out of slavery to sin. You can't obey your way into the family of God. You're let in because you're a son or a daughter, chosen and accepted by God before the foundation of the world, apart from anything that you have, will, or ever have done. But for covenant people, people bought by the blood of Jesus, obedience leads to right worship. Because obedience is this evidence that our hearts are captured by the God who loves us. And when we obey God, we show that God's word is in us. Obedience leads to right worship because it keeps our hearts pliable and in submission to God. Disobedience leads to disordered or neglected worship because disobedience sears our conscience and it hardens our heart. Like your obedience doesn't make you a son or daughter. Your disobedience does not negate your sonship. But man, it can harden your heart. Like even for the Christian who continues to just return to sin. Listen, it hardens your heart and it makes obedience even harder. And it makes worship even more difficult. And so you come into this place and we sing songs or you hear the word of God preached and proclaimed and it's like you're getting, just hitting a brass heaven as you walk into this place. Because your heart has been seared, your conscience has been disrupted by the fact that you're failing to obey what God has said. Not because God wants your life to be boring, not because he wants to steal joy, but because he's opposed to the things in you that will kill your joy. And he knows he knows that there's a way that seems right to a man that in the end leads to death. But there's this narrow way, this hard way that leads to life. Have you experienced this in your own life? Are you experiencing this right now? Is there something that God has convicted you of in the last week, in the last month, in the last six months, in the last year that you keep walking past? like an Israelite walking past the ruinous temple mount? 
head down, not making eye contact, hoping God doesn't ask you for the receipts? Have you found it hard to enter into worship with God's people? Impossible to find joy in God's word? Difficult to be encouraged and built up by the time spent in community each week? Could it be that prolonged disobedience has led to your conscience being seared? Could it be that the solution as a blood-bought covenant child of God is simply to obey so that you might finally find rest in right worship? That's what happened to the people in Haggai's day. And in an instant, after a decade of their hearts being hard, of their attention being turned to themselves, they moved from a hard heart and disobedient posture to obedience and they worshiped. And the same spirit of God that convicted them of their sin moved them to continue in obedience from that day on until the temple was built. A few years later, the walls were built and God's people were dwelling in his holy city. My last point this morning is that right worship leads to holy empowered living. So God's word leads to obedience, obedience leads to right worship, and then right worship leads to this ongoing empowering by the Holy Spirit to continue living the way that God calls us to live. It's not like they decided to go back to work and all of a sudden the opposition they were facing stopped. In fact, if you look at the story in Ezra, you see that the peoples around them who had sent a letter to the king of Persia and stopped the work in the first place, send another letter. And they're hoping that it's going to do the same thing. Hey, these people, they're going to be rebellious. They're trying to build the house for their gods. You've got to stop this. But because God has spoken to his people, they've heard his word. In face of opposition, they continue to obey. And even after the temple is built, the opposition continues into the days of Nehemiah as they rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Obedience that leads to right worship doesn't lead to smooth sailing. Life is still hard. The enemy still hates God's church. And continuing in obedience and worship is going to require hard work. The good news is, though, we don't have to do it alone or in our own power. Look at verse 14. It says that the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel. And then it says he did the same thing to Joshua. And he did the same thing to all the people. God's spirit brings life into the spirit of God's people. And they press on toward accomplishing the task that God has called them to. You want to know something amazing though? As cool as it is to read about the Holy Spirit of God stirring God's people in Haggai to accomplish the specific task of building the temple... Because of what Jesus has done through his sacrifice, the Spirit of God does not simply stir the hearts of God's people to accomplish one-off task. Because the veil of the temple was ripped and it is no longer necessary for us to enter God's presence through the Holy of Holies, but the Spirit of God is with us and dwelling in us. The spirit that stirred the Israelites to this momentary burst of obedience lives in you. And he is daily there to stir your heart and your affections for God. He is daily there to draw you into the presence of God so that you desire to obey, so that you desire to worship, so that you desire to have your heart pliable and molded by God. There's no more quick burst of God's presence when we need it most, but a daily indwelling of God's spirit from the moment that we're moved from death to life in Christ. Friends, you can obey God's word today because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit and you'll be able to obey God's word tomorrow for the exact same reason. What happens when we have a heart softened by obedience that experiences worship as God intends for us to experience it is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us even more stirs those affections we have for the things of God so that we continue in obedience with even more zeal than we had yesterday. Here's where I want us to end this morning by asking ourselves these couple questions. 
Is there an area of my life where God has called me into active obedience? And how am I responding? Are you responding to God's word with obedience? Or are you allowing your heart to become hard? Second question, am I allowing obedience to work its way into my heart so that my heart is pliable? Or has disobedience seared my conscience and dulled my senses and stolen the joy of affection for Christ? I want to leave you with that today. Let's pray. 